So I was born here, that explains the name, Çöl Tekin, that's a Turkish name, because the universe likes randomness. I didn't, you know, just that's where I was born. My parents worked there. It's a 2,500 meter high, really cold place so much that the lakes get frozen. My parents work there, one is a nurse and the other is a teacher. I'll let you guess which one which, because it's a gender talk. And these are not Turkey, even though a label might say Turkey, this, these are actually geese. These guys also lived in that little village of 70 families, perhaps more geese than people. When I was 10, we moved to Istanbul because my parents wanted to provide us good education, me and my brother. And as a girl, as a child girl, I was always asked what I wanted to become. And if I said lawyer, my parents really liked it. But if I said president, they didn't dismiss it. The world is mine to take. I was definitely given the opportunity and <laughs> came to Istanbul. A lot happened in between. And I studied in this very building to become an engineer. I studied in techno te technological schools. It was geographic information engineering. And we had been like 13% or so girls. And a lot of our professors were women. Our calculus professors were women. We had computer vision professors that were women. And it turns out there are a lot of top positions that are occupied by women in Turkey. Turkey actually figures about the highest number of board members, about 11%. The lousy 11% is the winner in the world, or actually among the OECD countries they studied. However, if you look at the best place to work for a woman, Finland comes on top. A couple of Scandinavian countries, no surprises there. Switzerland and Turkey clutter kind of in the bottom. So I went to Finland to do a PhD. Not because I went there, not because the women's working conditions were good. Long story, I only have five minutes. But this is how you get a PhD in Finland. That's a sort of a sword and hat ceremony. You have to walk under the swords. You even receive one. But I was the first one to receive a PhD in the field that I studied in Finland, while the very first woman who received a PhD in the world was here in the University of Zurich. It was a Polish woman, 1875. She waited 100 years to vote, but she had a PhD 100 years ago. And now I work here at the University of Zurich, Faculty of Science, and this is our gender distribution. About 50% of the PhDs are female, about 10% of the professors are female. So there's a whole kind of a gap. So you have undergrad people, you have PhDs, you have masters, but you don't have so many professors as it could be. Why is that? Part of it maybe is something called gender bias that can be unconscious. Is that real? Well, it turns out to be real. We don't seem to really accept this changing roles in academia. If you make a study, a blind study, where students evaluate female professors, they just evaluate them lower. You can actually fool them. They can think that they are evaluating a female and then, you know, the grades go low. And similar studies exist. You blind a CV, you just put a female name, you ask people, would you work for this person? And they go like, yeah, this person is too much out there for herself. She's selfish. I don't like her. But if it's a guy, oh, that's the leader. Sounds like a decisive person. I want to be like him, right? So we have a problem. Our mindset didn't travel. The gender roles are changing, but we're not quite accepting of it yet. But we are aware of it. There are all sorts of organizations. There's Women Who Code, there's Turkish Women's International, there's Kenyan Medical Women Association, Women in Aviation, Women in Science, Women in Technology. There's all sorts of things we are trying to do to correct this. In fact, there are quotas, as I think I missed the slide. But we also, whether we like it or not, whether we like successful women or not, that regardless of that, we also observe that girls are up and coming. If you look at the schools all over the world, in all subjects, including the hard subjects that are considered more male, girls are doing better. In high school, they are doing better. In universities, they are doing better. And that reflects, and that's where I want to leave the question uh, with, I want to leave you the question whether maybe in 10, 20 years from now, we should be talking about protecting men in professional lives. So this is how I'm going to end this talk. It might be premature, but I think it's interesting. <laughs>